Okay. Good morning. Welcome to EM lecture organized by the Candy Society of Medicine. Before I introduce the speaker, I'd like to give a few announcements. Yesterday, actually, we had a successful certificate course on cardiology. They are going to have a Another certificate course on endocrinology on 19th of this month. That is uh, the next week, week after. Uh, so just to go early to get registered, yesterday we could not be able to take you in some, some because of uh, now because of the current situation, we have to limit that number. So we were interested to join the endocrinology certificate course, registered early because we have to limit the number depending on the situation. Now the other thing actually there, now you saw the poster, we are going to annual session, April, the candidates had to make the annual session, we are going to have a hybrid or live meeting. And just to remind you, you have sex and people who are willing to apply for oration. Now this is time for you that, that, that email circulated among all the members and all through the, all the societies, including the Dovel Doctor Society, so that you can see that and there will be posters appeared in the notice boards. If you have any research papers, you can start working on that and to apply uh, for oral and the post presentation as well as oration. And another thing, actually, the case same. Even a lot of charity organizations work this this year. We are developing the Rasin Devi School here in front of our Candy Hospital. We are doing. Uh, we are already prepared. the done a uh, bigger notice, bigger board of the school. We are very ancient type of board name with the name actually and we are going to have it lab and the library and things who we are willing to donate for that particular project in the school in front of us you can come to the KCM office and donate and we those money will be used for uh, the development of the school because that is one of our responsibility as a professional and the responsible organization and to support the KSM, one is that I have told every day, and we have prepared a shirt and tie the name of KSM just to support the KSM. Uh, other thing, actually, the, today I received a book written by the Professor Chandra one of our well respected teacher, one of the best surgeons in the world, and a highly dedicated doctor. He has written a book called Anecdotes from a Surgeon's Life in Sri Lanka, 500 rupees per year. We issue the books to the KSM office. Uh, and all this money so is going to donate to PIMSA, PIMSA Student Fund for the, for the students' welfare activities. So, who are willing, please buy the book. It's only the 500 rupees. I, I first on I bought it. So just to respect him, that's the only thing I can do for him. I said, please buy and then we can send the money to, to the PIMSA for support. As another book written by one of our consultants, Dr. Deepa Gunavardhan on ECG. That book also is available in our ASM office. Support the people who dedicate their life for this type of activities to just to encourage them, and that benefit will go to any other person who is buying that book. And uh, we do another organ good work by Cancer Society in the tree planting program. Uh, we have done the tree planting in most of the places in the candy. You may know, you may not know. We are going to do a uh, we Select the one street in Kandy city. We are going to plant the big trees on the name of KSM. So just to support the society and the environment as well as to ourselves. So you can again donate some money if you have it for a KSM for that purpose. And we are going to plant the, about another 200 trees in the Rangal area. It's called the Thangapu. Thangapu on the forest department. Again, we are doing we are, anyway, we are doing that. I'm just uh, requesting you to support that. Definitely, I'm going to do that before I hand over the case. Just to support that, just to, as a citizen of the country and the professionals, and to safeguard this environment, we need to do some good, some work on behalf of ourselves, not for anyone else. Now, the today lecture, we are going to have a common problem management of GORD, gastroesophageal reflux disease, by Dr. Chaturamit Kapitayagam, he's our consultant gastroenterologist surgeon. Kadran was our, sec our secretary of KSM and our secretary of uh, Gastroenterological Society of the country, and is a uh, member of editorial board of uh, Sri Lanka General Medicine. And uh, I guess I just briefly tell him 
and uh, that's not going to present uh, talk on the management of GUR. It's a common problem. All of us face this problem when you're managing patient on day to day life. I'm inviting Chaturanga to start his presentation. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dushantha Medhagaran, for giving that uh, kind words of introduction. I'm very happy to do the first lecture of this uh, case in, in this year. So generally, traditionally, <laughs> it's been done by Dr. Mahen So, uh, so because uh, I think today there's a slight change. So, and requested by Dr. I want to thank Dr. Kaminda Marasingha, the secretary of KSM, to for inviting me to do this lecture. It's a very common problem. And it's encountered by all of us in any part of our lives. I think it is. We we have a lot of issues. It is gastritis, it is gastric ulcer, or gas. So many types of um, you know this. Uh, there's a significant overlap of many common terms used. So because patient will come and talk to you as okay, I have gastric. So. But I, I would stick to the definition of the Montreal definition is GRD is a common condition which develops when the reflux of gastric contents troublesome uh, with, with symptoms and complications. So this has esophageal syndromes as well as extra esophageal syndromes. So symptomatic syndromes like typical reflux syndrome, reflux chest pain syndromes, as well as reflux esophagitis, reflux. Uh, stricture, Barrett's adenocarcinoma are part of the esophageal syndromes. Whereas when it comes to extra esophageal syndromes, uh, reflux cough, I think Dr. Madhagadara may be getting a lot of patients with you know asthma deity coming with these symptoms. Reflux laryngitis, this goes with ENT, and uh, reflux asthma, reflux dental erosions. So those are associations. So uh, proposed associations like sinusitis, pulmonary fibrosis, pharyngitis and recurrent arthritis media are part of these diseases as well. So when it comes to functional dyspepsia, so I, I use this purposefully because it's not the reflux we are talking about, because they come with us many symptoms together. So they have postprandial distress, so it's meal related, so they have early satiety and postprandial fullness. And there's something called epigastric pain syndrome as well as as meal unrelated, they have epigastric pain and epigastric burning pain. So these common terms, as doctors, we should know what is reflux and what is dyspepsia. Those are slight differences. But if you look at this chart, uh, you can see um, this was taken from gastroenterology research and practice uh, journal. So uh, there's a huge overlap. This functional dyspepsia, irritable bowel syndrome reflux disease so if you look at this there's postprandial pain regurgitation pain heartburn epigastric pain etc all including in this you know there's a significant overlap which we need to know because the patient won't come and tell us the patient has reflux because they come with symptoms and we do have to analyze the patient's symptoms and come to a diagnosis so when it comes to gastroesophageal reflux, there's a physiological reflux and pathological reflux because uh, in gastroesophageal uh, junction is a functional sphincter and it has a times of uh, functional relaxation times, transient esophageal relaxation times. At that time, they can have a physiological reflux as well. So when it comes to pathological only, the problem comes. So this is commonest problem in the Western world and it's recurring problem and it uh, requires long-term medical treatment. There are many risk factors you can refer to in the internet. I think I'm not going to stick to the risk factors because you all know because uh, alcohol, fatty food, large meals, which rich food, um, smoking, hydrocyanide, these are the main contributors when it comes to reflux disease. But what is the most important thing we need to pick up in the symptom analysis is whether this patient has any alarming symptoms because these patients need upper G endoscopy, the age more than 55 with new onset dyspepsia, evidence of GI bleed, dysphagia, persistent vomiting, 
unintentional weight loss, family history of gastric co-inspected cancers, palpable masses, evidence of iron deficiency anemia. These patients need upper jaw endoscopy. And this is the endoscopic images which have uh, uh, shown as we classify according to Los Angeles classification, reflux is vagitis, and there are four grades, and we will classify these uh, uh, endoscopic grading is important for us to plan the management. So, there are many treatment options for gastroesophageal reflux disease. Medical management is first line. So, acid suppression with proton pump, pump inhibitors and H2 receptor blockers. I will. I initially told only about the endoscopy because there are many other things which we need to do the investigation-wise in certain patients. But we first start with. You know, when the, we give a trial of PPI and then there's non-responding, non we will do an upper jaw endoscopy and see whether significant reflux is there. And then we go for this uh, uh, medical therapy. But you can straight away start medical therapy if the patient comes to you directly without any alarming symptoms. So if the failing that, only about two months of medical treatment, we, uh, you know, you can refer to a specialist. Um, who uh, can do an upper endoscopy. So acid suppression can be done with PPI or H2 receptor blockers. One thing, this is a bit of a controversial point, you know, uh, H. pylori treatment, we do for H. pylori treatment for dyspepsia and uh, peptic acid disease. But in addition, it's not effective in reducing symptoms of reflux disease. This is a proven thing. Because in fact, it can increase reflux as well. That's the uh, newest arguments. So prokinetic drugs, domperidone, mosopride, and psychoactive agents like tricyclic antidepressants can be given. So GABA receptor agonists like baclofen also helpful. Psychological therapies, there are a lot of patients coming with reflux symptoms having psychological therapies. And there are interventions which we can do, uh, endoscopic or laparoscopic. So PPI, so efficacy of PPI, it can be short term and long term and it reduces the relapse rate of and reflux symptoms and it maintains healing of esophagitis and it also effective in treatment of complications like peptic strictures. So this is, uh, you know, this table recently taken and this is the esophagitis healing compared to PPIs and H2 receptor blockers. So you can see the esophageal esophagitis healing heartburn and also, also healing rates are higher with PPI than the H2 receptor blockers. So PPI trials can be used as once daily dosing. That's a, that is how we commonly start. It, standard doses are omeprazole 20 milligrams, isomeprazole 40 milligrams, once daily, pantoprazole 40 milligrams, rabiprazole 20 milligrams, lansoprazole 30 milligrams, etc. So you can use uh, any other PPI depending on your preference. There's no sick, no evidence that high dose PPI therapy is beneficial over standard dose dosing, but empiric trial of high dose PPI may consider in difficult cases. So high dose means omeprazole 20 milligram twice daily, isomeprazole 40 milligram BD, pantopsole 40 milligram BD, lapriprazole 20 milligram BD, and lansoprazole 30 milligram twice daily. So what is PPI resistance? When they're not responding to PPI, so we think this patient is resistant to PPI. It can be due to many reasons. You treat this patient and see, go through the history carefully and see whether there are any psychological comorbidities. Whether the dosing, the most problem is the time of PPI because it has to be taken half an hour to 45 minutes before meals, ideally. Because that is the time, you know, uh, that empty stomach PPI will do the magic. And uh, also, uh, whether this patient having eosinophilic uh, dysbiotis, and commonly the problem is esophageal hypersensitivity. So it is called functional heartburn. This is also another cause for the PPI resistance. And uh, weak acid reflux, duodenal gastroesophageal reflux disease, and there are many more which I have mentioned here. So, um, and also keep in mind, this may be a part of irritable bowel syndrome too. So baclofen is a GABA the type 3 receptor agonist, and uh, it reduces the trans reflaxation rate, uh, relaxation rate, 
and it helps in uh, you know reducing the reflux occurrence both acid and non reflux non acid as it increases the basal low vagal sphincter pressure and effective in combination with ppi so uh, tw 10 mg twice daily dose is or is um, is helpful so when you consider the ppi versus potassium channel blockers now it's emerging uh, medicine so it if you look at this it's sorry about the busy uh, slide but uh, you know when it comes to uh, ppi is it has a delay on onset of action and uh, but these potassium channel blockers are effective full effect from the first two dose and words and uh, there's a food dependent inhibition of gastric acid in uh, you know this uh, ppi but food independent inhibition in potassium channel blockers so uh, this uh, this will you know replace in the market soon and new hopes so we always have a new hope this medicine is always changing so uh, this was recently taken about 2020 so 2019 uh, journals so this new h2 receptor antagonist will uh, you know the, they are on research and it's on the market now gradually and ccp gastrin antagonist and delays release certain ppis and new agents like alprazolol and tintaprazole uh, coming in the market and combination of PPIs. You will be traditionally we don't combine PPIs with another PPI, but still it's it's in some trials and it's on the market. This omeprazole and lansoprazole together use. So then I would go into this pH. I'm thankful to Dr. De Kalgula. He's here. So because when they are not responding for the treatment with a high dyspnea most of the time, with you know we have looked for a careful history to see whether there's any treatment failures uh, any anything with the medication something is wrong and then we refer to dr the color to help with uh, ph and manometry the reason is because this is the next level we need to find out whether they have a significant reflux or not because then he um, you know may he has a gadget in in his ward and then patient has to wear this and press the gadget you know um, whenever they feel the gastric reflux symptoms. So what he measures is uh, whether they get a true reflux at the time of, at the time of uh, acid exposure, because they, when they feel the symptom, the patient has to press that, because that's, uh, they should be adequately um, informed regarding that, and they ideally should be off PPI for a, for a week at least, and uh, then, uh, but the problem is doing this test. The reason is because some people even can't wait for one week without PPIs. So there are certain, you know, difficulties we are facing, but then we find the cause and we can see the, you know, lower lines of the acidity. So that is the levels of, uh, you know, acid exposure times. But then what we look at the symptom correlation, symptom index and see at that time, whether there's a really significant reflux is there or not, because the patients, they should have a significant reflux for us to intervene. If there's no significant reflux at that time, the, the moment the patient press the button, that means patient symptoms may not be, you know, completely related to acid. If you do some intervention, patient won't get better. That is the most important thing, whole mark of planning this patient's future surgery or interventions so the manometry manometry uh, he does manometry for us to uh, see whether there's a low esophageal sphincter pressure how how it is helpful in um, uh, how it is helpful in uh, relaxation if there's a there's a hiatus hernia we expect the low esophageal sphincter uh, to have low pressures the generally it's about 14 millimeters mercury and it goes down uh, significantly in certain patients with um, um, reflux disease, especially in high dyspnea condition. So I'm not going to do much about this manometry because you they study and they send us the report. You can see that the upper margin is the upper esophageal sphincter and lower margin is the lower esophageal sphincter, which is the um, which is uh, green in color. So then this relaxation he will study and give us a report on the, how does this is helpful in hydroxyneas and then he gives us a report whether this patient 
needs any intervention and whether this patient will be benefited from interventions. So uh, there are many things we will look into and um, uh, these are a bit advanced ones, so I'm not going to tell these ones. Okay, so then, uh, as a surgeon, I would like to start with laparoscopic surgery, but we as a team, I think we are mainly forwarding non-responders for endoscopic therapy. Now, in, in Sri Lanka, it's available significantly, and in the future, I think these all these surgeries will be replaced by, other than the large hydrous hernias, all these things will be replaced by endoscopic therapy. I think I... Dr. Kalvo will agree with me. And the Nissan fund obligation, and there are certain modifications, or partial fund obligations, pill operation, ligament arteries, cardiopexy, and geodic processes. So, well, this is Nissan fund obligation. This is revolutionized surgery in 19, it's not an incidence, the surgery done in 1956. And uh, uh, they found they're significantly reduced in the reflux. And this is the simple way of understanding this Nissan fund obligation that is full wrap around the esophagus. Uh, it's done laparoscopically earlier. It was done open surgery and it's uh, effectively done laparoscopically. And uh, uh, these are the results you can see uh, because it reduces significantly the reflux rates. There's another surgery which is we do commonly do. Um, Two-pay fund application. Two-pay is done for the patients who are having a significant bloat. That when they have a significant bloat, if you look at this wrap, previous wrap, uh, this missing fund application, the patient can't, you know, burp. This is the biggest problem with surgery because they can't burp because it, it acts as a significant valve and they feel like a bloated person. So therefore, without doing this 360 wrap, if you see this as a 270 wrap is 270 degree wrap it is called the two pay fund application only anteriorly if we wrap it's called the dough fund application so there are many types of fund applications we do as surgeons the effectiveness and the decision will be depending on case by case if you think fund application is the option for this type of uh, you know reflux disease I would say I have done last year only three fund applications. The reason is not that we don't have patients. It's effective only in patients really selectively. So that I would I would because we get a lot of referrals for fun, you know, like having gastroesophageal bigger reflux disease. Now what we need to realize is surgery has to be very carefully selected. And we have to sit with the patient half an hour to identify the symptoms. Otherwise, they will curse you once you do the surgery. The reason is they can't, they can't vomit, they can't burp, and many, many things matter. So, but still we do. I think about uh, last week, I think we started on January 1st with a fund application of a 16-year-old girl. We did a wonderful design fund application. My SR did about 75% of it, and I was there. Only for 25 i mean <laughs> helping him so uh, it was a it was selectively the correct patient otherwise no one will be get benefited by such so operative complications are there are many complications like gastric and esophageal perforation bleeding a pneumothorax conversion to open surgery post-operative there are certain mortalities as well so problem i mentioned earlier post-operative uh, they have flatulence gas bloat dysphagia because if it is very tight it can cause dysphagia and uh, diarrhea they can unexplained diarrhea in most of these patients about 16 uh, percent it's very cumbersome to certain patients and reflux symptoms very rare the aim of fund application is to take them off ppi but what we need to remember if they have a concomitant dyspeptic symptoms and peptic ulcer disease please what you need to tell the patient is you we can't we can we can cure your reflux we can reduce your reflux rate but unfortunately you might have to be on ppi for what is you know what is called his gastric the word gastric the gastritis or uh, the peptic ulcer disease he has to be on ppi for that 
So therefore, aim of completely taking this patient off BPI may not be uh, the answer in certain patients in, uh, in pep with peptic acid disease. But only for, if you consider only reflux disease, that is the aim of doing any type of intervention to take them off PPI. So this is, these are the list of complications. So if you look at the quality of life uh, following laparoscopic fund obligation, so there's significant rate, you know, success at one year and three months, 95, 98%, you know, symptom, symptom, um, uh, they, 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 are, they are cured of symptoms, but you know when it comes long term, all these you know uh, options are equal generally. Whether you do two pay, whether you do endoscopy, long term the symptoms um, improvement is the same. So what is this gadget? This is about uh, uh, it's called the Lynx procedure. That is the magnet ring. So that will help to. This is done laparoscopically, tighten around the, tighten around the gastrointestinal junction, and uh, now it was very famous earlier. And now there's time that you know that it's going toward the links procedure. If you consider compare this Nissen fund application and links, so uh, it augments this okay, lowest figure swing tip, and it's a physiological design and always you can take it off if the patient is better so uh, then uh, this is the links procedure uh, you know the results you can see there's a significant symptom you can see the you know huge uh, you know it's not a huge it's a moderate side high hernia so after the links uh, it, the gastrointestinal junction is tightened by this um, you know, the endoscope so that that means is uh, there's no significant reflux here. So, endolopinal surgery. Now, this is the trend. So, it it is low cost, but it is questionable the, the wording of cost because uh, in, in in other countries, you know, laparoscopic surgery is very very costly. But sometimes in our country, when it comes to us, this uh, you know endolopinal surgery also can be costly. So, uh, it is an outpatient procedure, no incision, fast recovery. So that is what we are moving now. So uh, endoluminal implants, uh, endoluminal scarification, surgery. So endoluminal implantation techniques are there. So ethanol while alcohol is injected. So there are, and also uh, we can bio inject some bio, uh, you know, so we can put some biocompatible polymers. So uh, these are endoluminal implantation uh, techniques. So this actually we at the moment we don't do, but we do this. We have started. It's available in candy, and but it's for no hydrocernia or very small hydrocernia straight up procedure. We put some radio frequency uh, probe there, and we can burn it. Actually, we have done. I think Dr. Kalwal has done one case, and we are yet to start the cases because we want to. There's a significant overlap of the learning curve. So we want to get, you know, uh, the, the experts involved in, we know the procedure, but we want to do safely. And we have selected few patients and they are waiting to, for the strata. Unfortunately, the COVID has hit significantly. We went, well, we actually, we put a patient for RFA and on that day we couldn't do, finish that. So there are endoscopic suturing devices and endoscopic plication. So both, uh, this is called endoscopic gastroplasty. It has a very good symptom control, and we can reduce or take completely PPI off uh, of the uh, treatment pathway. Right, few disappointments I would say in um, treating in the gastroesophageal reflux disease. Um, regarding the PPI, there are many unmet needs. We have uh, we have done many things for these patients, but unfortunately, they are not happy. And 20 to 30 percent of the reflux patients, especially those with none, get the non-esophageal reflux disease, and also extraesophageal manifest patients with extraesophageal manifestations, they are not not responding well to any of the treatment you offer. That is a significant disappointment. When and 
only this is uh, uh, a straightforward message. Reflux is a very complex than you think. And the level, what is your level as a general practitioner? What is the level you can treat? So level is you can give a trial of BPI unless they they have a significant symptoms, alarming symptoms which require endoscopy. Because the problem is they come and tell you, okay, I have a patient who comes every year to get an endoscopy. So every year he comes and tells, okay, sir, I have endoscopy. This is the attitude we need to change. Because if they come with an you know endoscopy report, you know it's done by a respected unit. And uh, if we accept that report, I think we don't need to repeat the endoscopy for reflux issues, right? If we are planning to see a treatment failure, or if we think this patient uh, needs endoscopy to exclude new appearing symptoms of alarming symptoms, that is the only time we need an endoscopy. Because otherwise, it's very difficult to you know explain them that you don't need an endoscopy. It's a fashion to you know like do an endoscopy, right? To get get the endoscopy done. So they press on you to do an endoscopy. It's very difficult because we and all uh, you know Dr. Kalboila and all surgeons who does endoscopy face this situation because they specifically think endoscopy is the treatment pathway of reflux disease, which significantly um, uh, wrong. And stick to basics. What I mean by basics is proper history, because we all are busy clinicians. And even your GP practice, take a proper history and identify the problems of this patient because they have, uh, they, you know, they, uh, you know, they smoke heavily and they, they want you to treat for reflux disease. It's a very difficult situation. Okay, you come, you know, adhere to principles. Okay, these things, you know, alcohol, you know, like significant large meals and problem in in our societies like they they take a meal in the la large meal in the night and they directly go to sleep so that is the time you know low is because sphincter relaxes and that whole large amount of gastric contents will definitely reflux into the into the esophagus so the lifestyle modification wise we always tell them okay have your dinner a little early have a ppi have your dinner about half half an hour 45 minutes later and then wait about two to three hours and then you can go to the bed because that is the time if they directly go to the bed so that will allow the contents to come in and also the small frequent meals and cut down on anything you know uh, um, starch food because uh, if you take a lot of bread and because they take they drink a lot of water and then it swells so it's like a balloon swelling so then that can reflux contents but the spices have not significantly, um, you know, spices, it's controversial because there are no studies directly supporting this spice itself uh, increases reflux disease. But as practically, I think we all advise them to take less spices, right? Because it's very difficult to, you know, like NIMAS guidelines, NIMAS uh, reports say there's no significant uh, relationships. Um, and also, please refer alarming or resistant patients to a specialist because we don't keep a list of patients completely coming with reflux disease only because once we do the endoscopy and give a treatment plan i think as general practitioners you can follow the patient up and if you can pick up the problem in the general practice is you give short-term ppi you give ppi for three days that is the biggest issue what we are facing so your what you need to change is your practice up because if you if they expect you to give whole medicine within the amount of money you take from them which is a bad practice and you explain them and that is not what is required and give at least about one month two weeks you can give and generally so four to eight weeks of ppi has to be given to a patient when they come to you so that that will help you to cure the disease and prevent the recurrences otherwise this uh, you know, three days of PPI won't do anything at all. But patient himself or herself can take this medicine by them, their own, 
if you give a treatment plan there are certain patients okay you have this you know this disease we have identified and we uh, we know that you have reflux disease so at that time when you have a bad day i mean when if you are going for a function having a large meal take a ppi and go go for it but not as a practice right there there, there these are the advices which we can give them and also what we need to know is now there are many emerging endoscopic options and another thing which i have not typed but i want to mention surgery has to be done with ph and manometry it is a must because if you are doing any anti reflux surgery any anti reflux procedure it is after ph or manometry the reason is we have seen the treatment failures many treatment failures we haven't had those things before even we our teachers doing and we are learning as registrars in our units we didn't have a ph manometry so at that time of course as we did, we were resource poor we did that without ph report and without a manometry report so but now the things are changed because we can be we have a unit here dr kalapolis unit he will do the ph and manometry but there's a waiting list of course if they go to kalambo this cost this test will cost 100000 rupees 100000 115000 ph and manometry test cost is 100000 rupees but i will still spend that money before doing a surgery if the patient really really wants i mean if he wants urgent surgery or something that still i would okay if really want to you get it done this ph and i have done i sent to colombo because you know they didn't want to wait a queue in for 3 months here so i sent I sent about last year, I sent about six or eight patients to Colombo. None of them required such. So, therefore, that's what I'm telling. You know, because the report comes completely against PPI, in a complete against surgery. So, therefore, surgery is has to be very selectively done because otherwise, patient will suffer. Because the moment it's done, it's irreversible. So, therefore, that is why we are working very um selectively on surgery and also the last word is team approach because when we are treating a patient with reflux disease it may be my patient it may be your patient it's somebody else's patient so uh, because the to test to get the test done properly we refer to um get gi unit g, g unit here to get the ph and manometry and do surgery if it is so or if it is whatever the intervention the other important thing is that most of them have psychological issues and unmet which we have not done which we have not touched certain issues which we need to look into the history your history is the paramount of the treating tb uh, treating for reflux disease and it's i'm um, passing my time therefore i'll stop my talk and and i hope um you'll have a wonderful year with ksm because that is the academic organization which have offered many things to you and most of things i think uh, these uh, cme lectures completely free i'm very happy that you all are here because different aspects we need to learn uh, medical officers career development has to be touched and this ksm is the base for that as an academic organization i think uh, dr dushant is doing a great job in spite of covid he he never stopped a single activity as far as i know so it's very encouraging and uh, i wish you all a very happy uh, 2021 and uh, reflux free year thank you the questions yeah. The world standard the world standard right I've never seen him uh, bypassing the right lines. So, thank you very much for the great achievement here in Kandy. I've never seen him touching the patient without a uh, proper instrument for her patient before. So, the second thing is I'm going to put in trouble. So, there are certain patients, also for your patients, they have large hardness. Very poor peristalsis, large peristalsis weight and uh, very poor peristalsis. 
what are seeing some patients who are coming from some other part of the world the uh, uh, brain people who have done some surgeries in here this way yeah. patients are suffering a lot you can't do anything you can't take the life back so definitely we have some patients they are discussed already so what are the options available the patients are very poor the distance is large the brightness is significant very large uh, well, uh, it's a very <laughs> difficult question, honestly, because we have discussed this kind of patients. Um, you know, they when they have the moment, but we the problem is if you do an anti reflux procedure in these patients because of this poor re, you know, the peristalsis, they will have a retained food in the esophagus and their their symptoms can be worse. So other thing is, uh, well. Uh, the uh, the hydrosonia itself can cause uh, you know stasis of food this, so that is another thing which we need look, need to look into because when they take a food so they that get you know accumulated in hydrus as well and then can itself give a reflux also so therefore what i recommend is i i i what i do generally is like i do the test as you told and then try to keep them uh, with uh, uh, food, uh, small frequent meals, and see the response. You know, because I advise them. There are about I have a 30 year old boy like that. You know, he has a gastroparesis as well. You know, in addition to all these problems, he has a gastroparesis as well. So then they we give small frequent meals, like every two hourly. There's a small bits and pieces of meal, and then it it has sorted this problem to certain extent. But there's no, as you said, I'm very scared to touch this patient. The reason is the moment I do it, the fund obligation on this patient, patient can come with this patient. The problem I, which, which you highlighted is we have a standard treatment protocol. I mean, if they have a hydrocyanide, we do a fund obligation. The moment we do a fund obligation, if we don't look at the symptoms properly and do a fund obligation, design fund obligation, the, what happens is patient will have a dysphagia in this type of patient. If I'm going to do a fund obligation on this patient, I will do a two-pay fund obligation, like a, you know, two-thirds of wrap. I might do uh, that, but that of course, patient has to be really educated well and document in the notes. Gladly, our patients won't go to sue you. That is, <laughs> that is a significant advantage we have. But you know, personally, when you analyze these patients. You feel really bad about them when you can't offer a single thing. Then, but problem is that they come to uh, me today and they come next day, they will go to another person, they go doctor shopping. So finally, somehow they end up in, you know, somebody who interested in directly surgery. I mean, I'm not blaming anyone, not, this is not something personal, but the danger is that because they, you know, for example, some people go to uh, face to face, get the rapid antigen, you know, negative. <laughs> that is the attitude. Likewise, you know, till you get a no cancer report, biopsy, no cancer, till that they go to surgeon to surgeon. No, the moment they get a no cancer, no operation. So they kindly come with a very bad state. Likewise, so we can't satisfy everybody, but it's an honest discussion with the patient and sitting together. And uh, we have discussed these difficult cases. Okay, I'm. I'm, I have directly spoken to him you know, one day I got the patient down and sit with the patient okay I'm very I don't know what to do honestly there's no particular answer for that but I, that if I do I will do very you know mild fund of is like a two pay but life I will first put lifestyle modification they do well with lifestyle modification but they have to uh, you know change completely life with this reflux disease many 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 disorders particularly i'm getting a lot of patients who want to week and month and it's a month 10 15 inhaler they come with acute asthma particularly in nocturnal if we are causing severe amount of uh, bronchospasms that's the one thing they come with severe or soils and the laryngitis and the laryngitis edema, just try to write. I said, I had many, many cases. 
ਅਗਰ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਮੈਨੂੰ ਕਹਿੰਦੇ ਕਿ ਦੇ ਮੈਨੂੰ ਇਹ ਕਿ ਨੋਟ ਨਹੀਂ ਜਾ ਕਾ ਰਿਹਾ ਕਿ ਮੈਂ ਉਹ ਤੋਂ ਇਲਾਕਾ ਹਲ ਮੋਨ ਬਲ ਸ਼ਾਂਤੀ ਚ ਮੈਂ ਨਹੀਂ ਸੋਦਾ ਜੀ ਆ ਕਿ ਸੋ ਕੋਮਨ ਤਾਂ ਤੇ ਮੈਂ ਇੱਕ ਕੰਪਲਾ ਐਸ ਰਿਸਪੀਕ ਵੀ ਜੀ ਹੈ ਇਵੀਂ ਅਸ ਤੋਂ ਬਿਚ ਹਮ ਐਕਸਪਲੇਨ ਇਟ ਬਿਕੋਜ਼ ਦਿਸ ਪੇਨ ਮੈਨੇਜਿੰਗ ਐਟ ਯੂ ਐਸਮਾ ਉਹ ਫੋਰ ਨੋਟ ਓਨਲੀ ਦੈਟ ਈਵਨ ਦ ਰਿਸਪੀਕੇਸ਼ਨ ਐਟ ਯੂ ਹੈਵ ਟੂ ਸੀ ਯੂ ਪੀ ਡੀ ਯੂ ਐਸਮਾ ਫੋਰ ਇੰਟਰਸਟੀਸ਼ਨ ਲਾਈਕ ਦੇ ਦੇ ਵਨ ਬਿਗਸਟ ਪ੍ਰੋਬਲਮ ਟੂ ਕੰਟਰੋਲਿੰਗ ਦ ਟੀਟੀ ਦਾ ਪੇਸ਼ੈਂਟ ਹੈ ਐਸੋਸੀਏਟਡ ਕਿਵੇਂ ਯੂ ਆਰ ਦੇ ਪਾਰਟਲੀ ਰਿਲੇਟਡ ਟੂ ਅਵਰ ਮੈਡੀਕੇਸ਼ਨ ਵਾਟ ਯੂ ਆਰ ਯੂਜ਼ਿੰਗ ਪਾਰਟਲੀ ਦੈਟ ਇਸ ਇਟ ਦੈਟ ਯੂ ਹੈਵ ਇਸ ਐਨ ਐਕਸੈਟਰਾ and particularly uh, there are several patient who can be an obstetrical severe dyspnea admitting with the hormone dying syndrome they get severe spasm of the vocal cords and use two minutes they are struggling to breathe uh, they go place to place they go to the hospital as you correctly said no one is listening to the history so yesterday i was talking in the certificate form so to listen to history not a single thing here necessary it is the proper reward treatment and refer to you all as a medical case simple one me you also do some treatment and change the their medication and you not to go to bed immediately after the meal in the night is a dandy this problem they are not out of it also like a typical presentation of uh, GOR and, and now they say that we say that it's a part of the etiological process of interstitial lung the so called geographic interstitial lung this is that no one knows of course Now the GORD is the hypothesized cause for interstitial lung disease and the most of the lung disease, including lipoid pneumonia, sand aspiration, and chronic cough is one of the commonest causes. Commonest cause of the world is the chronic cough of GORD. So it is so common problem. I think the patients should be directed properly to the correct people. Any other questions? So we went up again to later. Now there are two books available written by Professor Kanara Sathanga and Dr. Deepa Gunavarjana. Very very good prices. It is to for the reference of the book actually the money is donated to them sir. It is to us the buy under the EC and EC book by Dr. Deepa. It is available in the case. And the one second thing is that. Uh, So we are going to have endocrine certificate course on uh, 19th of this month. And we are going to have a webinar for the value on asthma this coming Sunday by the ASM as well as the Sudhaka College of Almond Valley. You can join to our league, roughly, and uh, wish to join all these academic activities organized by the Medicine Society in the field. Additionally, you will have the certificate of appreciation. I must thank the professor from Qatar, who will be the first lecturer in the